that. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. Excuse me. We're kind of finishing up Pride tonight, kind of, in a way. And then in the next couple of weeks, we're going to... We just start it last week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did. You decided to cut it short? Yeah, well, there, was, well, there wasn't so much that I wanted to talk about with it, because we already kind of covered it in the Lesson the Greed sections, and it just kind of carries over. But then on top of that... Um, I kind of wanted to change focus with a few things, and I didn't. There was like three chapters on the book that I didn't really want to get into. Like he has this whole thing that he talks about with with the powers, you know, and and, and stuff. And he he takes that verse um, that Paul talks about with, um, you know, raging against the powers of this world in, in Ephesians, and he makes it into a whole thing where like all the different things are like powers and stuff. And I, I didn't really want to go on that route. If you guys want to, that's the book, and you, by all means, are welcome to it. Uh, it just really wasn't my um, thing. It's hard to teach something you don't believe in. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, uh, there's something else I was going to say. Oh, yes, and then we're also going to ship our focus back to back to discipleship to kind of finish up that, and then we'll go on to some other stuff. Um, so, last week we asked the question, for the question of the week, how do you combat pride? You did the lip smack. <laughs> With humility. Okay. Like, what do you mean? Like... Um, Doing something to humble yourself, like admitting something you're not good at, or okay. something like that. Like if someone says, "Well, hey, Michael, great guitar playing," have somebody else come up behind me and say, and "You'll get say, there someday." <laughs> yeah, you'll get there. No, but you know, you're like, well, you know, remember the stuff that you're not good at. Oh, okay. Let's practice. Um, go ahead and say something. <laughs> hey, great guitar playing, Michael. I know. Oh, I, that wasn't my line. Okay, let me try again. Go, <laughs> go ahead and say it again. Go ahead, say it again. Great guitar playing, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, but, but seriously. Um, okay. I suck at sucking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else or anything else? How do you bite pride in your life? I kind of came up with the same thing what Chuck was saying, you know, do things that hurts your pride, you know? Okay. Like... Get married? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, up high! Woo. Like, say... You're the you're the manager at a store, and the toilet needs to be cleaned. And, well, you clean it yourself instead of getting maintenance to do it or something, you know? Or... What if you're a really, really, really bad manager anyways, though? <laughs> right? Or um, you have issues with admitting that you're wrong about something, so you make it a habit to apologize about things that you're wrong about. You have a problem with... Oh, you were singing as an example. <laughs> okay. Like, um, with that last part about... Um, could you give more of a, an example of that? Um... Maybe, like, you got an argument with somebody about whether it's better to, I don't know, <laughs> easy example, put milk in first before the cereal or cereal before the milk? <laughs> Everybody knows it's cereal before the milk. Because <laughs> then it spiders up on you and your clothes and your wrists and it's just like, that's gross. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. And so then later you realize, oh, I was wrong. And we go to that person and say, hey, I'm sorry. You were right. No, 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 no. That other person was wrong. Okay? <laughs> Cereal does go in first. 
The other person was wrong, Grace. Okay. Any other ideas? Let's say you get a higher position on a job. Mm-hmm. Then the price is the same because you're a thinker above everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I would say even pointing out the good in other people. Mm. Okay. Do you want to elaborate anymore? Or? I can't think of it. Okay, that's fine. Just ask him. Ben? We won't judge you for not sharing something, but you better share something. Or even in church. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, and there's been a lot of times saying that you think you're more righteous than somebody else. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But I am more righteous than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you wouldn't understand, Diana, if you're around a bunch of sinners like I am. Back to where we came from. <laughs> Ben? Same place. You don't have a better treasure than me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, like, um, to remind ourselves and others that the um, talent or whatever is, is from God, mm -hmm. that it's not from yourself. Yeah. With that being said, did I interrupt you? Okay. With that being yeah. said, um, have you ever met one of those yeah. people yeah. who's think about it. right? And it's like they say in the most prideful way. Oh. Want to say that one. <laughs> oh well, it's God. <laughs> it's like oh, you're one of them. I'm just Got it. blessed and highly favored. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And, and you know it too. And they know that you know it. <laughs> okay. Really good ideas, guys. Um, this was my idea, or actually uh, his idea, I should say. The idea that goes with the lesson. <laughs> Not saying that you guys' ideas were wrong. I'm just saying this was the one that I wanted to emphasize. So, um, Service. Because with pride, it's all about you know serving self. It's all about putting self first. You know, you are on the pedestal. But with service, kind of the exact opposite happens. You know, mm -hmm. you have to... Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, but it, it, it can become a prideful thing. Yes, it can. Yeah. Yes, it can. Yeah. That's why I didn't say your guys' answers were wrong. <laughs> That's exactly why I didn't say your guys' answers were wrong. Look at how many people like that. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> or, you know, oh, look at me. I uh, let a car stay at my house. You know, I'm such a... <laughs> Inside jokes are the best. Um, okay. Uh, but there's something about, about serving um, that can... Potentially, um, get your eyes really off of uh, you know you. You know what I mean. A lot of times, like for instance, when we're going through struggles, you know, oh God, this is so unfair. All these things that I'm going through, and we actually start looking at other people's problems. You know what I mean? Oh, this person, you know, has a kid that's dying of cancer. Oh, you know, oh, this person's going through a divorce. You know, all these different things, and these are big issues to these people. And all of a sudden, you know, you start seeing your problem maybe in perspective. You know what I mean? Like the world doesn't really revolve around you. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I'm not trying to sound douche about it, you know, just kind of kind of saying. And then with service, it kind of goes along with the same thing. Um, w with pride, we kind of learn how to do things with ourselves. But but when we truly serve someone else, you know, it, it's just such a humbling thing to, to realize, you know, you know what I mean? To put somebody else in your life before you, you know what I mean? And uh, like, like Ben brought up, sometimes service itself can turn into a prideful thing. And uh, for that, I would say... Um, don't <laughs> let it, <laughs> you know what I mean? But with that being said, true service really can't be us focused. If we're doing something just to give ourselves a pat on the back, we're not really serving people. Like, that's that's something that we need to change in our hearts. And I think that really goes along with what you guys were already saying. Um, so at the, at, the, at the root of service, it's the idea of obedience. We serve because we're obeying God, because we're serving God, right? That that's, that's has to be the, the whole reason why we do it. Otherwise, it's just going to become like ben, like Ben said. It's just going to become some, something that's that's uh, a competition, um, and it has to be obviously guided. It it's done for a reason. It's done for a purpose. It's it's not just you know, um, well Ben, I fed three homeless people today. What did you do today? <laughs> you know. Oh. So anyways, and at the at the at the root of of combating pride are these three really topics. The first is submission. Pride is about me first. But with submission, you learn them first. You know what I mean? 
In a church situation, you learn to listen to other people rather than only listening to your to yourself. You learn to, to grow. You learn to, to, to stop thinking that you're the best thing in the world. You learn submission, mutual submission in the context of a marriage. You learn how to learn from your spouse. You learn how to discipline your kids with patience. In, in a work context, uh, you learn how to pay attention to what your boss says and, and why he's saying it because maybe he sees something you don't. In the context of family, again, you, you see like if younger people, obviously, sometimes when you get older, your parents you know, don't really contribute in the same way. But still, um, in, in the context of family, again, uh, where parents – your parents will be able to give you, you know, guidance and direction. There's that submission where you don't have to necessarily do what they're telling you to do, but you do kind of have to listen and, you know, and, and kind of, you know what I mean? Respecting and honoring somebody isn't about doing everything they tell you to do. Respecting and honoring is about the attitude of your heart before them. You know what I mean? Respecting and honoring isn't something that you do in lip service. It's something that you do uh, in, in, in your heart. You know what I mean? And, uh, well, anyways... Uh, and then the second idea that I kind of, I think kind of sums up how to combat pride is the idea of forgiveness. Because once again, if pride is putting self first, forgiveness is the ultimate way of putting someone else first. You know what I mean? It's the ultimate way of saying, look, it doesn't matter what happened. I forgive you. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean, and pride doesn't let us do that. Pride always says, I need to be um, paid back for the wrong that I have suffered. Pride says, it's not fair to me. Pride says, how can I make myself more comfortable? Pride's, you know, that's kind of the attitude of pride. And so forgiveness kind of is a 180 from that. Um, and then the third part is wisdom. And what I mean by that is in Proverbs, it talks about wisdom. And when it talks about wisdom, it talks about listening. It talks about the fool, you know, is always say, saying stuff. His mouth is always open. But it talks about the wise person who closes their mouth and listens to, to advice, listens to counsel, listens to their parents, you know, listens before they act. This kind of whole idea of, of handling encounters wisely. But pride doesn't let us do that. Pride always has to be, I mean, first, I mean, there, it's what I've already said. Pride always has to think, I am the only person who has ideas. I'm the only person who hears from God. I'm the only person who ever knows God's direction in life. I'm the me, me, me. You know, it's all about me. Even in the context of Christianity, it, it, it's it's very me focused. You know, um, some people, for instance, have taught that 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 leading worship is is more more for us than for God. That's a prideful worship, right? Because it's about us. Well, that takes away the whole idea of worship, which is about God. You're worshiping someone greater than you, the only one who's actually worthy of it. See what I mean? And so when you make worship all about you, that would be prideful worship. Um, or when someone comes in the door and you instantly judge them. Pride. When someone, you know, does something, and like let's say, for instance, the pastor does something and you don't agree with it. So rather than just letting it go and moving on, you, you feel like, you know, you just kind of let it stir. You talk to other people. Maybe you, maybe you gossip or complain. Maybe you talk to other people about the poor decision. You see what I mean? Stuff like that. It's that attitude of pride that says, you know, it doesn't matter their feelings, it matters me first. And so those kind of the ideas that go along with service, the idea of submission, the idea of forgiveness, and the idea of, of wisdom. So um, so some lessons that I uh, I found when I was reading through with, with the Gospels on what Jesus did. Yes, absolutely. Excuse me. Got a burp there. It's just not coming, guys. It's not coming. Kind of. Okay. Are you done? Okay. Um, so then, some things that, that I kind of noticed from, from the Gospels that um, that are kind of how Jesus dealt with the issue of, of pride and power and whatnot. First off, use your power wisely. Because remember, we talked about last week how everybody has a measure of power. Maybe you don't see yourself as, you know, this president or CEO of a business, but you still have some measure of power in your life. Um, and so the, the, the first thing there is use your power wisely. Jesus was here for a very short time, but yet he used his power wisely. First off, when he was a child and he submitted to his parents for the sake of maturing in character for, the, for when the time would come. See what I mean? He could have easily said, well, my time here is too short. I've got to get going on this. But instead, he did submit and was able to grow, it says, in character and, uh, uh, w you know, with how people saw him. You know what I mean? What, what is, it says it, favor. That's the word. He grew in favor with, with God and with men. 
uh, because of because of that. Um, and obviously, we can always count on Jesus to do the right thing. You know, it, it's even been asked, well, is Jesus possible? Is it is it was Jesus able to do the wrong thing? He was tempted, yes, but was he actually capable of doing the wrong thing? Since God cannot sin. I don't know, man. That's just a circular argument if you think about it. Because he was a person, so he could. But he was God, so he couldn't. But he was a person, so he could. <laughs> See what I mean? It just goes back and forth. I don't know, man. That's that's for people who have nothing else to do with their lives but argue. As far as me, I don't really think it's that important. I think that the point is that he didn't do it. You know. Um, anyways, and then he talks about in the parable, you know, with the... With the um, oh, Diana, you did it? He talks about in the parable about the people who have the talents, for instance. He talks about you know how wisely did they handle it, you know, and uh, so use your power wisely. The second thing is never abuse your power. Um, Jesus very much so had every right to just come in guns a blazing and just start sending people to hell. He had every right to do that. I mean, remember God's the one who's been wronged in all this. We haven't been wronged. God was totally able to just annihilate people. However. He chose not to. See what I mean? And so instead, he chose to save people. And uh, you you see, with Jesus, he didn't abuse that power. Satan's talking to him. He says, you know, you can call down a host of heaven where you won't even stub a toe, right? And then Jesus says, well, I'm not going to do that. See what I mean? Uh, when he was on the cross, again, he had the opportunity, but you no, know, I'm not going to do that. W with, with Judas, I mean, once again, how many times d does it say that loving them, he loved them till the end? You know, with speaking about the the disciples, and also as it applies to Judas specifically, you know that he he knew it was coming, he, he saw it, but instead of you know preemptive striking, and instead of you know um, getting irritated with Judas, instead he gave him every opportunity and loved him till the end. You know, and and I think that's that's really what what, what Pastor has been talking about on Wednesday nights. Um, and uh, true prophets, you can always tell from the false prophets because of the abuse of power. False prophets, they're in it for something, for the name, for the money, for the reputation, I mean something. But prophets who are really – do what? Uh, prophets who are really um, seeking after God, you, you'll notice that they don't do it for those things. If they don't get any recognition, it doesn't matter because that's not why they're there. You know what I mean? They don't say, oh, pay me and I'll give you God's message. They say, here's God's message. See what I mean? And, and that's kind of the, what Pastor's been talking about with the heart of a, of, a, of a prophet. But anyways, never abuse your power. Third, only act for the greater good, not out of irritation. This especially rings true for those people. Is something wrong? All the lights out there. It's right out there. Somebody died. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to feel really bad if somebody actually did die. Especially if you're someone I liked. I mean, if somebody dies and you don't really like them, it's like, ah, whatever. <laughs> just kidding, people listening online. <laughs> Anyways, um, especially with with parents, it's very easy to um, – I still have some more points on this oh, slide. Okay. so uh, It's especially easy to – like, for instance, when – when your nephew starts sassing you. <laughs> um, it's very easy to, to respond out of irritation rather than responding out of what's best, what's the best way out of the situation for everyone. Um, but yeah, especially because, guys, you're all, you will always have power in your life. You know what I mean? And it's just throughout your life you'll get more or less power. You know what I mean? And with those different amounts of power, you need to always know how to deal with that power. Um, how did Jesus use his power? Any ideas? Besides what I've mentioned, you can't say something I already said. I'm, I'm down on this side if you want to take a picture of Diana. What do you mean how did he use his power? Like, so while he was on earth, mm -hmm. he had, you know... Power, obviously. Mm -hmm. How did how did he use that? How, when you when you think of the gospels and and, and Jesus knowing that he had had power, um, what rings out to you about to him? Help people. Okay. To heal them if they were sick. Or... Okay. Very good points. Outward focus. He said about healing, and he said about um, what was the other thing he said? To help them. And, and helping people. Okay. Any any other any other things? Okay. Anybody else? He served people as well. Okay, like 
give me more of an example because um, he gave kind of clear things. So I kind of wanted well, to see you. Well, uh, what taking. I'm thinking of is when he washes his disciples' feet. Mm-hmm. And how we should all go and trap black people into rooms and <laughs> wash their feet, wash right? Wash their feet, yeah. Don't let them leave until you wash their feet, right? Just wash the whole body, actually. <laughs> 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 that got dark. <laughs> uh, kind of threw up no, a little bit, guys. No, it was dark. It just got darker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> awesome. Any other ideas? Um, Healing? Uh, already, already been said. said oh. <laughs> Ooh, I'm just doing the baby. She's picking her nose. She's not paying attention tonight. <laughs> hey, put a put a put a baby in the room and nobody cares. Ben, were you were you gonna say something? Oh, okay. I, th- I thought I saw your hand. So. Nicole, you gonna say anything? I don't wanna have an awkward silence for you guys. But. Okay, so um, everything around and uh, around us is in a tug of war of, for power. Um, I, I, without really elaborating, I just kind of want to see what you guys come up with on this. Can you think of any examples of that? The only thing I can really think of is the government. Okay. Can you elaborate a little bit? There's pretty much like the country versus the president or mm-hmm. versus the government. Okay. okay. We want it this way, but they want it this way. You're talking about like with the Republican, Democrat right. nonsense? It just keeps going back and forth, and you. nobody really makes any progress. Well, I, it, it it's in everything. Work, home, you know, everybody wants to gain power, you know, between spouses. They mm-hmm. think they want to take charge, you mm-hmm. know, even a Kids woman. I'm not saying it's in my house, but, you know, I'm saying in general. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to be yeah. in charge. Yeah. yeah. That's power. Yeah. And did you guys hear what Chuck said, too? I'm going to say that again with everybody. The kids try to take charge over the parents. Oh, mm. yeah. Sometimes the nephew tries to take uh, charge over the whole the rec center. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> you see it in church, too. Like, um, some people try to use how much ties they give. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's at, that's at a lot of churches. Yeah, yeah. That's at a lot of churches. Although surprisingly, it's usually people who've been saved longer than thirty years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Usually the new converts don't really do that. They're just kind of getting into the rut of starting to pay tithes. Yeah. You know, they're just starting in that, and you know, so. Um, anything else? Really great examples, you guys. Grace? Hello! Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, so I'm going to just walk, give some examples. I think you guys already did a fantastic job with this, though. Um, in the spiritual world, uh, here's some examples. Legalism, you know. Um, I want you to dress a certain way in 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 a, in a building. I want you to go to a certain place in order to worship God. I want you to to, to <coughs> talk a certain way in order to, to you know what I mean. It's all about what I want. It's about that 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 tug of power. And then you have other people doing the exact opposite. I'm not going to do it just to tick you off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, like I have known people who got tattoos just just to make the older Christians mad. <laughs> No other reason. Like, they didn't even want the tattoo. It's like, well, if you're going to get a tattoo, you might as well get one that you like. Come on. Whatever. Uh, ownership. Yeah, Gracie already mentioned this with the whole ties thing, but it goes beyond just ties. Um, it goes into, you know, uh, it, it, sometimes if people will donate things to the church, they feel like that's theirs for forever and after, you know. I and helped. they get mad and take it with them when they leave. <laughs> right? <laughs> I helped pay for that chair. I helped pay for that pew. I helped pay for that material. You know, whatever. And it kind of gets into this thing of, of, of ownership. Um, and violence, I'm not talking about traditional violence. I'm talking more about uh, violence one against the other. You know, hey, Chuck did this to Nicole and Diana did, you know, see what I mean? That kind of violence, the whole um, uh, inner fellowship violence. 
Um, as far as the state, uh, uh, Nicole already mentioned this. Senators, presidents, governors, they're all kinds of, they're all kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't even know anymore. It seems like, um, it seems like more and more we're seeing uh, people just want to do things their own way. And it just keeps reminding me of the book of Judges. Everyone did whatever right in their own eyes. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Of course. It doesn't even matter. Uh, and then personal world. Uh, somebody mentioned this. I think it was Diana. Um, you know, sex, for, uh, not just in the marriage specifically, but also sex more broadly too. Um, you know, it becomes a thing of, 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 you know, who's in charge and stuff. Uh, finances, you know, uh, it becomes a thing of, am I in charge of my finances or is God or is my family or is my parents? You know, all these different things throughout the course of your life. There's always so someone else you're fighting with for control of your power until finally you give it up to God. <laughs> when you're a kid, you get in fights with your parents because they don't want you to spend your money like that. When you're older, you know, you get in a fight with whoever. Then you get married and it's a fight with your, with your spouse. And, you know, it's always this thing of, of who has the right over my money. Um, and then, obviously, with dominance, we already talked about that. Um, so we don't all have the same amount of power, but we all must do the best we can with the power that we have. You know what I mean? And that's just the way it's going to be. Some of us may end up to be, you know, uh, presidents, not Micah. Uh, you know, presidents of the world, not Micah. Uh, <laughs> some of us may end up to start, you know, life-changing businesses, not Micah. Some of us may... <laughs> just kidding. I'm just I'm just joking with you guys now. Uh, but anyways, you know, and we all have those those different things that we do with their life. And, and But the truth is it doesn't matter about, oh, if, if I had more power, I would do this. You see people do this all the time. If I had more money, I, I would help with orphans in Africa. Mm -hmm. If I had more time, I would... Well, it doesn't matter about the what is of what you could potentially have. It matters what you do what have can now. You do right. What you have. And Yes, exactly, and what you do with it now. I have a newsflash. If you aren't giving to missions now... You won't later. <laughs> you won't later. You know what I mean? Like, I've lived in the church too long, and I personally have struggled with this for too many years to, uh, to be fooled. Like... If the, that's the rule of life. If it's not done now, it won't be done then. There are a few exceptions, but usually no. Just only out there. So um, that takes us uh, kind of full circle with when we first started, we started talking about prayer. And I confused a lot of pre people because I told them not to pray. And they got really confused. And I had so many questions, so we're just going to go back to it. I'm going to say it in a different way. And I think it will resolve the issue. So first off, prayer is communication with God. You know, you're making a petition to God, you're, you're requesting something, you're uh, praising Him, whatever. It's that communication between you and God, okay? But here's where things get complicated. We aren't supposed to pray for things that go against God's plans. That seems like a simple idea. Okay, like, oh, no, I got that. You know, hey, pray for things that are good and don't pray for things that are bad. But it's not that simple. Like, for instance, Jeremiah is praying for the people of Israel. God, please don't, please don't exile them from the promised land. You know, uh, please have mercy on them. And God tells them three different times, no, stop. It, just stop what you're doing. Stop praying for them for, for this to, to not happen. It's going to happen. That's just the end of the story. So I was like, well, hold on now. What does that mean? Like, for us now, today. And so that takes us back to this. We aren't supposed to pray for things that go against God's plans. Well, okay, pause. What do you mean not to go against God's plans? Doesn't God want to give mercy to people? Like, how was he, Jeremiah to know that that wasn't God's plans? How do you know what to pray for and what not to pray for? I, I think, um, well, it happened to me. Uh -huh. uh, I was praying for my parents, uh, like, one way, and, you know, you kind of like you you pray you pray and the Holy Spirit will let you know that this is not what you're supposed to pray for about this. You know what I mean? Blam! Exactly right, Diana. <laughs> the way you find out what to pray for and what not to pray for is through prayer. Right. <laughs> the more you pray, God just kind of, you know, we were talking about this in one of our meetings. You know, uh, it's easy as a pastor to. God rained down hell and damnation on Jehovah's Witness and da, da, da. You know what I mean? It's easy to do that kind of stuff. But then after a while, praying like that, God kind of impresses on your heart like, uh, what are you doing there, buddy? What, uh, what's going on there? Oh, you know, just praying for you to slaughter people. Okay. Because well, they deserve it. That's something. 
Uh, did I ask you to do that? No, no, this one's pro bono, guys. It's, it's me. <laughs> my gift to you. <laughs> my gift to you. I got your back on this one. See what I mean? And the truth is, it's like, well, no, over the course of time, you know, God shows people, you know, okay, no, I don't really want you to pray for that. And that, that's exactly what Diana said, exactly what she said, exactly what, what I wanted her to say. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, sometimes you're not really going to know, and then... The more you pray, God just kind of directs you. So then people get kind of, well, I don't want to pray the wrong thing. And, you know, here's the thing. Don't worry about it. Okay? Start somewhere. Start somewhere. Seek after God. <laughs> he'll do the rest. He'll work in you. He'll start changing your attitude. He'll start changing your perspective on stuff. Then you keep praying still. And then he starts changing the situation. And, you know, then you're like, hey, man, whatever happens is cool. Because he's not going to answer it in the same way that you're probably thinking anyways. Just throwing it out there, you know. And uh, just what a, what, a, what a freedom that comes with that when you realize, hey, I don't have to uh, I don't have to have all the right answers in prayer. I just have to pray to the one who has all the answers. Oh well, okay, that's easy. You know, what I mean, there's no there's no magical formula that if I pray this, you know, God's gonna rain down his blessings. You know, there, there's no magical formula like that. The prayer of Jabez. <laughs> you guys remember that a few years back? Well, I was like 12 years back now. Yeah, it was a long time ago. 14 years back? I don't know. Anyways, what was that guy's name? He had like 70 different versions of that book, The Prayer of Jabez. Um, remember, he had it for kids. He had it for yeah. adults. He had it for Bible studies. He had the, And I was just thinking, man, how do you make a Bible study out of like two verses, man? Jeez. Huh? Well, anyways, what was that guy's name? His name was Wilkinson, Bruce Wilkinson. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that, yeah. Man. I'm pretty sure we had at least four of the different versions in our house. Ago. 17 years ago? January 1st, 2000. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was a while. <laughs> Man. <laughs> was I that young? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I remember when that got going. <laughs> I guess I was about seven years old. Wow, I can't believe I remember that. Anyways. Um, and uh, also another thing, since he brought up prayer of Jabez, since <laughs> you already kind of mentioned, I don't know if you guys heard him, but... Uh, he mentioned the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer wasn't meant to be something that, you know, I'm going to pray this exact same thing every day and then God will bless me. You know, it's it's not it's not like that either. Um, I do have something to Yes, add, uh, go ahead. Uh, when, I, when I was at work, it was about, it was towards the end of my shift. This lady called in and she had just gotten out of the hospital. Uh -huh. And she was at a really, really bad hospital. But one of the nurses, God kept telling her to pray for her. She kept telling her, and he kept telling her, and she didn't want to do it. But she ended up doing it with a hood and hood. Uh -huh. But as time went on, she did it more willingly. Because uh -huh. what had happened is the nurse had severe laryngitis and couldn't talk. By probably two hours after her praying for her, she got her voice back. <laughs> well, that might have been a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> for she instance, like what, was her husband happy about this? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. The kids, how did the kids feel? The no! God, why have you persecuted us? <laughs> well, okay. So I hope that that clears up the thing about who to pray for and who not to pray for. I hope that that really clears it up. Because I feel like last time, I mean, like three different people afterwards were like, wait, I'm not supposed to pray for people? I was like, uh, okay, let me try this again, guys. <laughs> so, um, so that takes us to kind of this with the whole idea of, of power or uh, pride. And uh, you like this, guys? Made this all by myself? No, I'm just kidding. Mine, mine looked like a, it looked like a. Uh, Mike actually did this one, guys. <laughs> it looked like a, a square cube, and then it looked like a little line, and then there was like this rock, I guess. I don't know. It was just weird. <laughs> but this one was actually done, I believe, by Ben, right? No, I did this one. Did I really? I did a better job than I thought I did, guys. <laughs> well, shoot. <laughs> all right, that's cool. Um, okay. So this is kind of how God works in us, okay? Um, we are we are the, the little thing at the bottom that's being turned into a diamond. Um, excuse me. And I, we actually use this diagram for our discipleship class. Um, and God is in the process of working in you and making you uh, something new and something that he can use, okay? Uh, and But through the process of this, he uses... A hammer and chisel is, is how Bill Gothard shows it, and that's where we got this diagram from. Um, and basically, God will use these different things that cause irritants in our life. Okay? Uh, 
Okay? These can be things like our authority figures, um, our circumstances in life, our finances, whatever that thing is that's causing us irritation. Okay? And uh, one example that we use in the deception class for, um, for younger people is the example of a father and mother. Um, that you know through that you know oh, well this is irritating me and everything well yeah it, it it's it's an area of, of of irritation I got that but it's so that God can work something in you and what happens is God works in us the character that, that that we need you know what I mean and, and the areas that we're lacking because He loves us and He doesn't want us to be a spoiled brat um, you know uh, an immature Christian a uh, you know I go down the list. Um, and so when God's doing these different things in us, remember that, that, that God's, God's using this as a process to, you know, hammer out those bad things. You know, it, we're going through things for a reason. And a lot of times that's the only way that, that pride will really be um, crushed. Okay. But here's, here's the flip side of that. The Bible mentions that, that someone who continually hardens himself will be broken and, be, and that beyond repair. So think about... Um, if you hit a spot in this rock, I don't know, whatever, and you can't you can't chisel it anymore, and so you, you whack it again, and every, it just goes to sh it goes to shatters. Okay, kind of it shatters. Uh, kind of think of that with the example. It, it's something where if you harden yourself against what God is working through you, it it's going to cause damage in you that is going to be something that, that you know is is definitely something that's going to going to mess with the rest of your life, uh, and that's what pride does. Pride hardens us. So that as God's trying to work in us, and we harden ourselves with that pride, it causes us to be broken beyond repair. See what I mean? And God's able to use us still in the future, but it leaves something in us that's a scar that we'll, we'll forever have to deal with. You know what I mean? So, um, how do we overcome the pride in us? We kind of already talked about this, so this isn't something you're supposed to answer. This is just, you know, kind of introducing the idea here. Hardening your heart will lead you to being crushed beyond repair. Pride at its heart is an unteachable spirit. At its heart, um, you know, pride says, you know, I don't, I don't need, I don't need your instruction. I don't need your ways. You know, I don't need, I don't need you. Um, and kind of, so, really, at, at the heart of, of a prideful person is that inability to, to, to learn. You know, people leave churches because they're too prideful to to change. So I mean, pe people uh, leave marriages because they're too they're too um, uh, prideful to change. All these different things where we really have to. Sometimes we have to take a loss, you know, and and we don't really want to. So in James four seven through ten, he walks us through actually a process um, of of getting rid of the pride in our lives. And serving, serving people, you know, all those things about that you guys said about how to, how to cut down pride in your life, that's a good thing. But sometimes in, as pride is allowed such a place in our life where the only way that God can get rid of it is by leading us through a traumatic situation. See what I mean? Does that make sense? Some, sometimes, it, were you going to say something? Like one of the women that was in my training class when I first started at work, uh, she used to be a millionaire. Uh -huh. And you can still see it in her personality, yeah. her spirit. Like you see... The pride. Yeah. Because she would come to work every day and just talk about it. Yeah. Constantly. They got all day. She works at a gas station. Yeah. So I mean it. Yeah. So James chapter four verse seven. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He's saying a bunch of things here all kind of crammed together. Because remember, James is written to – the book of James is written to a group of, of, of Christians that are going – they're going through persecution, and it's not fair persecution. And, and so James writes this letter to help them learn how to deal with the things. And one of the things that he talks about specifically with these groups, with these people, is even though they were wronged, they had pride in their hearts from this. And so he's giving them, giving them a way of, of – basically James is saying this. Just because somebody wronged you doesn't give you the excuse to it's harden your heart. Pride. Right. Or, right, exactly. Like, I'm not going to go to church anymore because right. they hurt me at church. Exactly. And so what they're doing, exactly right, exactly right. And so what they're doing 
is, is they're kind of hardening their heart about this, and because they they were they were wronged and, and they didn't deserve that. See, what I mean, I'm not saying that 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 they did deserve it. Obviously, they didn't deserve it. But then what had happened is they were getting an unteachable spirit because the the burden was too much for them. See, what I mean, have you ever been in a place like that where, where where you're being persecuted? You're going through a really dip in your life spiritually, and it just seems like everything's coming against you. You know what I mean? And so you start getting a bitter, hurt spirit. You you know you know what I'm talking about? And that's exactly what's going on here. And so he gives them, gives them these pointers of how to get out of that. Um, the first one, uh, submit to God. Do things God's way. Listen to this, okay? Submit yourselves, therefore, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do you, do you notice the contrast there? The devil, the devil comes, resist him, and he'll go. You seek after God, and he'll come. So I mean, getting rid of getting getting rid of uh, Satan's influence in your life and getting God's influence in your life. See that? Resist the devil, draw near to God. The devil will flee from you, and God will draw near to you. See that? So, um, come on, you can do it. Okay, resist the devil. Decide not to sin. Sometimes we just kind of let ourselves into sin when we get too frustrated. You know what I mean? It's kind of like ah, it doesn't matter, whatever. Um. <clears throat> draw near to God, fully seek God through fasting, prayer, scripture, cleanse your hands, repent. And so what he's talking about is really a lot of different things here. And he's saying it repeatedly and in, 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 in a bunch of different ways so that everybody kind of gets what he's saying. First thing that he's saying is do, do things God's way. Submit, submit to God in your life. The second thing that he's saying is repent from the sin that's in your life. And stop doing it. Stop allowing that in your life. Okay? And so that all kind of comes together in the in this in this. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Now, what does that mean to be wretched and mourn and weep? Humble yourselves before the Lord. Seek after the Lord with a whole heart. So I mean, that's what it means to be wretched, to mourn, to weep. Because instead of just oh whatever the problems the problems just already always going to be there. Well, how about you take that same energy that you're doing and not doing anything. And you instead focus into fasting, focus it into prayer. You're already sick from sick from not eating because sick and not eating from from worrying about it anyways. Why don't you turn that worry into fasting? See what I mean? And so that's kind of what he's talking about here. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt you. So all throughout that, he said in like three or four different ways: live God's way, seek after Him, okay, and repent of the wickedness in your life. He said like three or four different ways. Cleanse your hands. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me let me just read it because I'm going to misquote it here. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, flee, uh, uh, resist the devil, and then be wretched and mourn and weep. You, you see that? He's about seeking God and repenting from the sin. See, you guys kind of get that. Um, I, that that was really really breakthrough for me because you kind of I've read this so many times. And once you realize he's kind of talking about this whole balloon thing here, it's like, oh, that's so much easier to understand. I got it now. And then, uh, so the question of the week, what is the job of the pastor in comparison to the church? I want you guys to think about that, okay? What is the in job? Comparison to the church. Right. Compared to the church, what is his job? Yes. Like, let me reword it since you guys are asking, okay? okay. How does the job of the pastor any different? Is that Micah? Any different than the job of layperson X? Do you know what I mean? This person here, or this person here. What 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 is their job? What what do they do? See what I mean? And I want you guys not to think about this. I want you guys to go to scripture about this. Okay? Look in scripture to see what you can find. I'm gonna give you give you a few freebies. Okay? First uh, Timothy and Titus. You'll find something there. And uh, Hebrews. And. Um, Matthew and Acts and uh, yeah that should get that should get you guys started but uh, just kind of skim through this see what you can find 
Okay. I'm interested to see what, what, what you guys come up with. And then after you guys have kind of messed around with scripture for a while, then can I add your own thoughts? What do you think a pastor's role is supposed to be? What attracts you to a pastor? Like, you know what I mean? When you go to church, what are you looking for in the pastor? Uh, what what seals the deal? This is the this is the guy that I want to be my pastor. What is that? You know, um, or, or what do you think uh, some pastors are lacking? You know, just kind of think about it. Wrestle with the idea for a little bit. I, I, I kind of want to see what you guys think about it. Okay. Uh, any questions about the topic? No. Okay. Next week we'll talk about the church, and that will be that.